Well, let's uh, let's get into the word together. Uh, open to Matthew 28. You should have a bookmark in there already. We're never leaving Matthew ever. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, <clears throat> all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Lord, we come before you once again with this passage, and we ask that we would not just be hearers, but doers. And so change our hearts, Lord, and give us favor, Lord, as we go out in faith. In your name, amen. So how's your evangelism going? How many of you had a chance to share Jesus with someone last week? Raise your hand high. That's awesome. Way to go. Uh, how many of you failed miserably and you know it? Raise your hand high. Praise God. There's room to grow. Amen. <laughs> We're all in this together. So the enemy wants to get there and go, you are worthless. You can't do anything. Don't listen to that voice. Listen to the voice of your father says, come on, let's go next time. Let's go. I'll teach you as you go. Amen. And so this is the great commission. We're hanging here because Jesus, we, after this big, long teaching in Matthew, we get to the end and Jesus says, Hey, I've got a mission for you. I'm out of here. I'll be with you, but I've got something I want you to do. And he says, I want you to go. So he gave us an action item and to, to make disciples. I want you to go and make disciples. And first we're to go as part of that, com that, that commission to go and communicate the actual gospel to all nations. It's implicit in that verse. It, it's implicated in that verse as we spoke of last week. In order for us to fulfill the great commission, if we are all followers of Jesus Christ and Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to obey me. Right. And it's not just, just to love one another. It's like you obey everything. That's what a disciple is. We, we learn to observe all that he's commanded. Well, he tells, commands us to go. So how many of us are going? And that's the question. We're just going to keep doing this until we become a going church. Amen. We're going to go because he said to go. This is what he gave us. And part of that going is first the communication of the gospel. We have to speak it and we have to live it. Those two things in front of the world around us. We talked about that. And it seems to be the communication, the talking part is the more difficult part with many people that I talk with. How many of you share that? Oh my goodness. It's difficult to share. Some of us, it's like, it's difficult to live. Some of us, it's all the above, right? And so last week we focused on overcoming the fear of communicating the gospel. And we, and we kind of hunkered down on, on Moses and, the, and Exodus chapter four. And, and we kind of, we commiserated with him a little bit and his response to the Lord when the Lord told him to go. And he had all these excuses and all these shortcomings that he was looking at in his own life. Nevertheless, the Lord had called him to go and he gave him answers for each of those issues. And I, and if you were not here last week, I would encourage you to go listen to that again, read Exodus four and say, Lord, okay, you're calling me to go. I'm, I, I'm, I'm slow of speech. I can't communicate well. They're not going to listen to me. All these things that Moses said, and just watch how God said, look, put your eyes on me, put your eyes on me, put your eyes on me, put your eyes on me. I've got you. And that's the overall message there. And so it's important though, because in the commission, there's two parts that Jesus is asking us to accomplish as a church. One is people need to come to Christ. If they aren't coming to Christ, we can't teach them. Amen. But that's pretty, it's pretty simple. And so we need people to come to Christ. Say we need two people. God is calling us to engage in his mission to bring people to him. That's a beautiful calling. How beautiful are the feet of those who share the gospel. We want to be part of that beautiful mission. He's calling us each to that. And so there must be that new birth within someone before you can teach them. Otherwise you get religion. And so anytime I'm hanging out with someone, I'm trying to find out, are they saved? Does that make sense? Before I start telling them all about how to live Christ, because you can tell people morality, but if there's no change within it, the spirit of Christ is not in them then it's all superficial nonsense. 
and they could be a great person and go to hell. So we want to have a change in the heart. And that's only something God can do. And we do that by communicating the gospel that we're sinners. He's the savior. And as we believe upon him alone, we're transformed by his grace. That's something God does. He changes us from the inside out. We're born again. And then like new babies, we become hungry for spiritual things because we're born in his nature. And we begin to learn about his kingdom And that's where the second part of the great commission comes in. Once we're born again, once we're born again, we need food to grow. Amen. And so therefore that Jesus says in the second part of it, now it's time for you to teach them to observe all that I've commanded. Teach them to observe all that I've commanded. That's 2820, right? And just as we all have the responsibility of evangelism, that's sharing Christ with people through our words and our walk. We also have the responsibility in the second part of the great commission, being devoted to helping fellow believers grow in Christ, grow to maturity. We all take part in that. Now, let me clarify. I think there needs to be some clarification. A few things before I explain our call as individuals and also as a body in teaching people to obey. When Jesus commands his followers there in Matthew 28, and I believe there's a great gathering there in Matthew 28. I, this does not mean when he says, I want you to all teach. He's not, I, I think this does not mean that everyone in that gathering was now promoted to the office of an official teacher in the church. That's not what's happening because there were apostles there. Does that make sense? And so that's important. So, so we know in James chapter three, verse one, and this is why I want you to think when I tell you to teach, it doesn't mean you're going to be a pastor. Does that make sense? So you don't need to get all nervous. You don't get nervous. Oh, great. I've got to start leading a Bible study. It's like, no, that's not necessarily what God has called you to. So, We know in James chapter three, verse one, for example, says not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. And what James is talking about there is the official role of a teacher within the church. That's what he's talking about. James is talking about people like himself, an elder, a pastor, a leader within the church who is teaching someone else. That's That's important to distinguish those who are overseeing and instructing the church in doctrine and so forth. So don't think that Jesus is saying by him saying, Hey, now I want you to go teach that you are now in that role of a pastor, teacher, elder, all that stuff. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Those are specific giftings and they come with qualifications and that's raised up through the leadership and, and recognized by the body and the Lord obviously works in those things. There's a lot of teaching there. We can, we can go into that, but that's specific to the teachers within the church. And, and so just to give you a little more clarity on that, on those roles within the church, the official teachers, you go to verses like Ephesians four verses 11 through 16. This is where Paul talks about the specific gifts to the church, that Jesus gives gifts to the church in the form of spiritually gifted leaders. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, it says, and he gave to, he gave to basically to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, or the pastor teachers, depending on your on your translation. Why? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body. And it keeps on going till they become mature. That's, that's the whole thing. So what Paul is describing here and in other places are gifted leaders within the church that Christ gives his church as servants to equip us. And I say us because I've been under teaching and pastoring. and I've got brothers that I'm submitted to all that stuff where we are growing and we're blessed by them. And without them, we hurt. Does that make sense? There's no direction. There's no leadership. There's no guarding of doctrine, all that kind of stuff. We go astray. And so there's a really important aspect that God has given us in those are our, our attribute in the body of Christ in those gifted leaders. And so there are those that God has specifically called to win people to Christ. Did you see that? That there are evangelists in that, in that gift, in that, that list of gifts. Did you see that? There are evangelists. So super naturally gifted people who just win people to Christ. Let's just take the greatest kind of like example we've had, like just say Billy Graham. Make sense? 
you know, just someone who they just preach and people just come to Christ. And, and so we look at that and go, well, I'm not called to that. It's like, no, we're not. I'm not called to be a Billy Graham, but am I called to share Jesus with people? Absolutely. And so there are specific people who are called to teach in the body and to instruct in the body. For example, pastor teachers, and we recognize those gifts and positions that the Lord Jesus has clearly given to his body for edification, that we become mature in Christ. I think a helpful way of looking at that is because when this is the reason why I'm saying this is because when we say go teach, we automatically think of a teacher. We go, I've got to be that. And that's not what I don't think is totally being communicated here. It is because there were, there were the apostles there, but also they're just general people like, like y'all, right? And like I was, and he says, and I think a helpful way of looking at this is in your own families, you've got parents and you've got kids, right? And it's supposed to be, let's just do ideal world that the parents <laughs> are the mature ones. They exemplify what it means to be a, an adult and responsible and selfless and giving and hardworking and all those things, right? Let's just say, take an ideal there. That's what a parent's supposed to be. Our children that on day one, no, you don't flip your keys to your car to your, to your two-year-old and say, have fun. Although we're doing that these days for some reason. No, that's not what happens. I think that just like natural parents as parents, hopefully teach and exemplify maturity. The children over time begin to take on the attributes and the responsibilities that their parents exemplify. Correct. They're looking at them and they start to mimic them and they begin to do what they do. And usually the way they do it and all that kind of stuff. And you can see your kids and you both for good and for bad. Until they are, they themselves are adults and are fully mature and are able to do what parents do. Does that make sense? That's just a real basic analogy, you know, so, and so too with maybe spiritual leaders in the church, they're supposed to be the mature ones who exemplify Christ that we can look to and go, wow, they know about him and they live him out in front of you. And, and, and there's an example there before you to, to grow into, does that make sense? So, If you look at it like this, we all as spiritual children have Christ as our head. Amen. There's no one more spiritual than Jesus. No one more to look to than Jesus. And we are to take on his likeness. Amen. That's the aim. We take on his likeness. What he began in us by making us born again, we're to grow up in, to grow into. Right. We're to work out our faith with fear and trembling. And so that is to be exemplified and taught by those gifted teachers and elders and so forth. And although we are not all pastors, we all have the call to have the heart of a pastor. Does that make sense? So we're not all pastors, but are we supposed to care for one another? Are we supposed to tend one another? When we see error in one another's lives, are we not supposed to reach out and say something or help? Yeah. Although we're not in that official role, we're all called to it. Same with evangelism. You can look at Billy Graham and go, man, he's winning people to Jesus. And you just look at that and you go, oh, okay, you got, you got that. No, we're all part of that. I might not be Billy Gramming, but I might be home with my child, just teaching them about Jesus day after day, year after year. That's all I've got. That's what the Lord's given me. Make sense? We're all called to share Christ with people. And just as we're not all teachers in the official capacity, so to speak, we're all to, we all have the call to help one another mature in our understanding. How many of you been walking with the Lord? And I asked you to raise your hands over a year. Man, you have something to share about Jesus that someone who hasn't been walking that long does not know, does not understand. And you might be looking at yourself going, well, I'm not a Billy Graham. It's like, we're not, he's gone. God is calling you to look in love, to help those brothers and sisters around you. When we see error, when we see, oh man, they just need help in this area, as we all do. An act of love is to begin to engage those people and to help them, you know, and it comes through practical situations a lot. And so 
we want to help one, each other, one another mature in our understanding of Jesus. Okay, so we're all called to teach in that sense. And so this call to teach believers to observe all that Jesus commands is absolutely directed to spiritual leaders without a command. And by the way, that is a major problem within church leadership is they don't do this. They do everything but teach them to know what Jesus said and to follow him and to obey him and love him. It's all about other things. I'm not saying everything, but that's, it's prevalent. But it's also for each one of us. We all have an on, ongoing part to go and to teach. Okay. Romans 15, 14 is just one example of this. Romans 15, 14 comes to mind. Paul speaking to Gentile church and he says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of what? Goodness. Filled with all knowledge and able to what? Instruct one another. Paul looks at this church and says, listen, you guys are full of goodness. You guys know Jesus. You're able to instruct one another. That means to help one another grow in Christ. Make sense? We all have a part in this. And so let's look in depth for at a second for the, the second half of the Great Commission. Matthew 28, and just look at verses 19 and 20. The first part of 19, the first part of 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Make sense? The first part of verse 19 is baptizing them. And that means that there's been a regeneration within them. So that's, there's the preaching of the gospel in there. But the second part is that Jesus says, once they become a believer, you and me individually and together through our various giftings, we are to be about making disciples through teaching them as well. To, and notice Jesus is, is, isn't interested. He said, do not, he says, I want you to go and make sure people go to church on Sunday. That's the great commission. Is that the great commission? Is that what you read? Everybody should say, no, that's not what he read. That's not what he said, right? I want to make people religious. No, no. I want to make sure you tithe. I want to make sure I have a Learjet. No, that's none of that, right? You know that. What does he say? He wants to make what? Disciples. That's what he's interested in. And by the way, disciples meet together on Sunday. Yeah, we do. Do we meet together throughout the week? We absolutely do. Are we concerned about each other on other days other than when we meet? Absolutely. Why? Because Jesus is concerned because <laughs> we're his body. We're, we're one, right? So this is not dismissing all those good things, except for the Learjet part. You dismiss that. But the word here for disciple, what does it mean to, to have to be a disciple? If you want to make them the word disciple do you see a word in there that we kind of recognize discipline, right? And the way the, that it works is it comes from the Latin and, and it goes into the Greek. It comes from the Greek, goes to the Latin, goes into the English. And the word there has the idea of a discipline. If you go into a discipline, it means that you are focused on that field. Does that make sense? You're focused on that field in order to emulate whatever that the object of that discipline is. And so the Latin discipline, uh, dis, uh, disciples, which means a student or a learner or a follower, which is derived from the Greek methodes, uh, which is one who is a devoted pupil or a student or a scribe of another. Jesus wants us to be absolute students of him. He's not interested in you checking the boxes. He wants you to be following him, looking at him, listening to him, learning from him, getting your very life from him. That that's what he's, that's the whole deal. Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Cause if not, you're not going to make them make sense. So step one, be a disciple. The idea is a disciple is someone whose aim is to learn and follow Jesus in such a way that the reflect their life reflects his. Does your life reflect Jesus Christ? And let me ask this. It's like, we, we look at the end thing. Okay. I'm not a Billy Graham. Is it more and more and more reflecting Jesus Christ as you walk along with him further, right? We're learning how to follow him. That's the, that's the trajectory that we're on. 
Something that was birthed within us is now growing within us and growing out of us, taking over us. And the idea of a disciple, someone whose aim is to learn and follow Jesus Christ in such a way that their lives reflect him. In becoming a disciple, there is a devotion to Jesus, a discipline of will towards him, a longing and willingness to be transformed by him along with our actions that reflect that no longer conformed to the ways of this world, our minds not being conformed to the ways of this world and the way this world is not teaching you anymore. It's not telling you how to think, how to act, what to do. You're not getting your cues from the world and social media and all the philosophers out there. You are getting your cues from Jesus Christ and his word. And you are going, your way is the way. That's what a Christian is. The way we think about everything. He's Romans 12, one, do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are now to be transformed by him. We let his life bear fruit within us as we just abide in him. Jesus said in Luke six forty, a disciple is not above his teacher, but listen to this. Everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher, Right? So in, in the context is something else, but there's truth in that. He says, listen, a disciple's not above his teacher, but everyone is fully trained. In other words, when you're mature, when you finish the training course, you're going to be like your teacher. This is what Jesus is saying. He wants us to be like him. I love Acts 4, 13. Here's a practical example. The elders and the rulers of the law saw Peter and John. They were out ministering and speaking the word and all this stuff. This is in, in Acts 4, 13 it says now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were uneducated, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. <laughs> what was it that shined from Peter and John? They recognize this is just like the guy we put to death. This is just like him. He's, they've got that same boldness. They've got that same spirit within them. There's this zeal. There's a witness to the truth. And we hate them. <laughs> it's basically the Their words and actions were just like Jesus. You see that? And so there in Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus gives us our aim our goal to be disciples who make disciples. It's, it's our, what Marcus likes to do what and how and who we'll, we'll, we'll kind of give into that. This is our, what, what we're to be about making disciples. Well, verse 20 gives us the how first by baptizing. And obviously that talks about regeneration, but secondly, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So we make disciples through teaching with the aim of the people we're teaching to observe all that Jesus commands. So really quickly, it's important. The word for teach there in the Greek is didasko. That's important for you to know this week. Sounds like something you put on tacos. But the idea there is, is to hold discourse with one another is to talk back and forth and communicate. Didasco, dialect, is kind of part of the word, but also dialogue is really the root of it. We're to dialogue. Right now you have a monologue, correct? I'm talking with you and at you, basically. You're not talking back to me, although some of you do. And this is definitely a, an important part of teaching in the word. But I tell you what, another super important role, which actually I would say supersedes this in many experiences is the dialogue about Jesus Christ that happens between believers. Thus life groups, thus the one-on-ones and all these experiences you have where you actually get to ask questions and they're answered. Amen. And so the word there for teach in the Greek is the idea to hold a discussion with someone, to have an ongoing conversation with believers about Jesus, not about the chargers and their new coach and how awesome they're going to do this week. I mean, this year, which we all know. And the church said, boo, I know it's like, those things are fine and fun. And we can, we can talk about those things, but ultimately 
We want to edify one another. You know, what comes down the heart of hearts? What's going to help us live our lives? It's him. And so we want to have Jesus on our lips and in our discussions, not as a measure of law, but as a way of life. Make sense? And so the word for observe, and the idea is that we teach in such a way that people observe what he's commanded. That word observe is terrero, which means for one to attend to carefully, to take care of, or to guard. The idea is that there's a continual action there to continue to take care of it, to continue to guard it, to continue to hold it close to your heart because it's precious. What he says is more precious than anything. It's like gold. It's like honey. It's sweet to the soul. So when we hear the words of Christ, it's, it's something to be taught in such a way that people regard it as lofty and high and beautiful. And it's something that's yours and you hold to it and you guide your life by it. So Jesus wants us to teach and to mimic in such a way. So other believers hold his words close to their heart and continue to apply and live out what he says to his glory. And that is not only caught uh, taught, but it's caught, right? It's not only communicated on a Sunday morning, but it's also modeled in the body of Christ. And that's important as well. And so there's a pattern here that Jesus lays out. The more mature are to be devoted to helping the less mature grow in the love and obedience to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. The older help the younger. And this is not age. This is time with Jesus maturity. And this happens through teaching, through the intentional dialogue between believers about Jesus. Now this teaching shows itself differently in the body. We know that the Lord appointed elders to oversee the flock. And so we have the official teaching. Listen, it's important that we get truth, right? It's important that we don't get weird. And so God's appointed those spiritual overseers of the church to make sure that we're studying the word of God, that it's actually what it says. And you're not getting bad food. Make sense. And so they're the protectors and the guarders. The role of like elders in the church is to feed the sheep and to protect the sheep and to tend the sheep. Feed the word of God, protect them from false doctrine and bad things that are going on and to tend to them. What's your practical need of help? And that's kind of what the elders are busy about. And we can do a lot better job, obviously, but that's what we're doing. And so there are elders who teach and model the truth. Then there are small group leaders and Bible studies leader, women's uh, Bible study leaders and so forth who are qualified to teach within the church. They're mature believers. We don't just throw anyone into those positions. Do you know that church? Those beautiful men and women of the church are seasoned people who love the Lord, who are in line with truth. It's important that that happens. And so each one of those men and women have a level of maturity in the Lord. So no one's getting bad food, so to speak. So there's a structure that the church has set up that the Lord Jesus has set up. And that's for our health and protection and growth and all those things. But then there are other opportunities. And these are the ones that are off script, so to speak in our daily lives. Amen. That we most run into opportunities to for us to disciple one another in the Lord that aren't organized by the leadership of the church, but are commanded by Jesus Christ, you as believers. And so for example, one-on-one -on -one discipleship where the Lord brings to attention someone's need in the church. How many of you feel like I don't know very much about the Lord and I feel like I should know more, even though I've been a Christian for X amount of time. Anyone else? Yeah. I feel like that with guitar. I feel like I know five chords and I'm like, I should probably know some inversions and things like that. And it's like, I get together with other musicians. I'm like, yeah, okay. I'll just, I'll just play first position here, but you guys take the fun stuff, you know? Uh, and so it's just, I understand, but what we need is someone to come alongside of us and help us. Right. And so part of it is us saying, I need help. I need a Paul in my life. I need a Paul to lead me and guide me and teach me. Lord, give me a Paul. I'm going to start asking for a Paul, so to speak, or, you know, I'll take some, I'll take anything. Just help me, Lord. Amen. And then some of us are, are along further and, and we don't have a Timothy. 
We don't have someone we're pouring into and teaching all this amazing stuff that God has poured into your life over the years. And so there's this thing that the spirit of God does within the church where there's this supernatural, natural edification that happens. And so we start praying for these things and God starts connecting us together. And then there's these weekly meetings or however you guys get together. And you're just spending time with one another, talking about life, talking about the Lord, talking about what it means to follow Christ in any given circumstance. Amen. Yeah. And those are the things that we need to be devoted to and looking for and asking for. So there's the one-on-ones. There's the one-on-ones, you know, how about you moms with, with kids? grandmas with kids. Let's just say, I remember Christine being at home with John and Ruth when they were young, you know, this is my personal example. Christine is obviously she's, she's bright. I know she's just saying she's, I'm going to get in trouble. She's bright. She's intelligent and all that stuff. She could have gone on to be a doctor or whatever she wanted to do. And I, and, and she would have been great doing it, but it, the Lord put it on her heart and my heart that, she just was to be home with the kids and pour into them. That's what she wanted to do as a mom. And again, you got to seek that out with the Lord. But I'm just saying being a mom is not for the faint of heart, especially being at home with the kids all day long. Any of you moms have said that. I've just said, say amen. And day after day, month after month, she communicated to them who Jesus was and what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And she taught them through example and through word and through all those things and by her words and actions. And they are who they are today, a large part by obviously it's God's grace, but his grace working through her every day. You're going, Oh, it's because he's a pastor, Matt. No, I'm here with you. And all that stuff. She was the anchor at home doing all of the work. She was discipling our children. Yes, I had a role in it, but she poured out her life. She followed Jesus and just day after day prayed for it. And and you moms are, I'm just giving you an example. So if we're not looking at, okay, I'm not getting across the street and I can't even get the clothes on my kids. And you know what I mean? Just what God has put in front of you in that season of life Say, Lord, this is what you've given me. Amen. Take it and, and take that example and throw it into whatever situation you're in. I have a, we have a, Christina and I have a dear friend, uh, you know, from down, down in San Diego. And, and, and he was, um, he tells the story and, and he's, God's just used him in amazing ways. And he, and believe me, this is not a boastful situation. He was just sharing about how God used him where he should never have been used. He was, you know, he had a bachelor's degree and he got pulled into a a black ops program and he didn't tell me anything about it except for whatever facility they were in. There was no lettering and no one knew where to go. And it was, you know, it was just a black ops program. He was, he was, he was locked away with triple PhDs and he he tells us about what am I doing here? And he goes, well, you're the man that we want you to be here to do this. And he's like, okay. Well, anyways, he got locked away with triple PhDs who never saw the light of day. And guess what? Some of them came to Jesus through him. And he began to share. They had Bible studies off hours. And they began to grow in Christ in their hobbit hole of whatever they were doing just took the example, the the opportunity that God laid before him and prayed about it. And just people came to Christ and, and he discipled them and just shared his life with them. And that was for a moment in his life and went on to do other things. You know what I'm saying? So where are you? Where has God placed you in your life right now with the people that surround you that yes, need to know Jesus, but perhaps they just don't know about Jesus. You know, I think one, how many of us, when we get older, we get kind of frustrated with immaturity. Anyone just like grow up. It's like, well, maybe no one's helped them grow up. Oh, they should be doing this, but they're not. Anybody got those attitudes going on? I never have that attitude. I look at you guys and you guys have that attitude. Lord, forgive me. 
But anytime I start to get frustrated, I go, you know what? Why aren't you about helping them grow? Why don't you get in the mess with them and love them to the point where they can see a little bit more of Jesus in their circumstance and understand something about him? You know what I'm saying? There is a lack of discipleship going on everywhere. And I'm not just talking about in the church, but our nation is fatherless. And we can't let that creep into the church. The mature must invest in the immature. Amen. And to be immature, by the way, is not a bad thing because there's a season for it. Amen. You don't expect babies to drive us, you know, to drive everybody to practice. That comes later. Make sense? But we want them to grow to that place where they can take on responsibility. And so the point being that God place, places us, when Jesus is speaking about discipleship, it's not just the official teaching of the church. Yes, as I'm doing now and I'm explaining and hopefully you're being edified and challenged and going, oh, I see how it is and it's shaping and, uh, and, you're, and the spirit's speaking to you and the word's speaking to you. You go, I got to do something. Yes, amen. That's, that's what happens with, with when we disciple someone. So there's this, but then there's the life of the church. And this is you guys and what God has put you in. And, and we, we are to pray for one another in these circumstances, encourage one another in the guerrilla warfare that you're in. Amen. And perhaps you start stepping out and you've got a Timothy because you're, you're a Paul in this situation. And you realize quickly, I don't know what I'm doing. Anyone been in that situation or have a fear of that? Like with evangelism. That means you need a Paul. Amen. You need someone who's been a little further along you. And so you reach out and there's this chain that keeps getting connected of God's truth being translated through his, the life of his body on through the generations until his return, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in until Jesus comes back. So teaching others to obey Jesus comes about when we are sensitive to his spirit and faithful with the opportunities that the Lord has placed in front of us. Listen, I want to encourage you to pray for and look forward to step out into opportunities to be discipled first of all, but also to disciple others. And if you're too busy to do that, you're too busy or you're not looking, you know, he has that for you. And I just want to re reiterate, we teach through words Amen. You have to communicate. That means we have to learn more about Jesus. There is a knowledge of Jesus Christ, which is good and healthy to know. We don't want to teach false things. That means we're just going to be continually learning ourselves. But also, secondly, oh, by the way, if you want to just have a, a dump of what do I teach just look at Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Salvation, our witness, anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, loving our enemies, giving to the needy, how to pray, fast, our treasure, where it is, anxiety, money, trusting God, seeking first the kingdom, judging one another, discerning one another, asking, seeking, knocking, the golden rule, how a tree is, is known by its fruits, building your house on the rock and the authority of Jesus. That's just a start. How many of us as I went through that list and you're just like, yeah, I know all that. You know what I'm saying? Let's grow. So we're to dialogue with one another about those things. We're to teach with our words, but also, and this is the part where I want to encourage you as well. Secondly, not only with our dialogue, but with modeling it, modeling it, living it out. We, we not only um, spell it out, we live it out. And so we teach through modeling. The greatest model we have of God, the Father, is God the Son. Yeah? We would not know much about God other than what is revealed in general revelation, the world around us, apart from his Son being revealed to us. Colossians 1.5 says of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He's the image, the exact image of God, the father, God, his spirit. You want to know what he looks like? You look at the son. Hebrews one, three says the same thing. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by his wor the word of his power. That's Jesus. 
In other words, Jesus, God in the flesh, is God made visible. John 5, 19, Jesus describes how he and the Father are in sync. Talking about being an example. Talk about mimicking. Talking about being an imitation, being an example to one another. John five nineteen, Jesus speaks this way. He says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son of the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does that the son, the son does likewise. In other words, whatever the father wanted to say, Jesus was saying, whatever the father wanted to do, Jesus was doing wherever the father wanted to go. Jesus was going. They were one. They are one. Make sense. Spirit manifested. John 14, 18, eight through nine. Jesus explains it again. Philip, the disciple said to him, Lord, show us the father and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? You still do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show me the father? I am the exact, I am, I am God in the flesh. There is no difference. His will is my will. That's the perfect picture. And then Jesus goes, I'm going with the father and now I'm in you and you are to mimic me to one another. Wow. Now there's one sense in which we are not God. Amen. We're not that, but there's another sense where God is in us. If we're born again, if his spirit's within us, amen. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what he's talking about. So we are to be an example to one another of him as his life is formed within us. That's how we, we, we are to demonstrate the transformation that Christ has brought about in and through us to one another. This is why Paul in first Corinthians chapter 11, verse one says to the church, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Do what I do. Cause I'm doing what he does. Now that's a bold statement. Amen. Like I think Paul alone <laughs> kind of says that, but we're all to aspire to that. Amen. That's what this whole thing is about is that we become like Christ to the point where we can go, look, this is what he does. And this is how he lives. This is how he acts. This is how he speaks. This is how he cares. This is how he loves. I'm not perfect in it, but do you see him? Hebrews three thirteen seven. It says, remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. That's how you know whether or not you're to follow someone, not just what they teach, but what's the outcome of their life. What does their faith produce? Right? And imitate their faith. In 3 John 1 11, John simply says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate what? Good. He makes it very simple. Whoever does good is from God, and whoever does evil has not seen God. Now he's not talking about everyone on the earth doing good. He's talking about, there's a context there. People who say that they are of God. Right? Don't imitate evil, imitate good. But imitate those who imitate Christ is the idea. And so we're called to make disciples by teaching to obey that all he's commanded by intentional discourse and by the example of our lives. How's your life? How are you imitating Christ these days? Do we all have a little bit of room to grow? Amen. But like the whole belly flop, high dive thing we were talking about, if you missed out, you know, we are so scared of evangelism that we're never willing to jump off the high dive in fear of a belly flop. Just jump. Same with one another in teaching people to obey. Just get into people's lives and, and be open and and let the Lord teach you as you go. God will teach you as you go. Amen. Be willing. Let your life and your schedule be open for one another. Say, Lord, my life is your life. My time is your time. My schedule is your schedule. Open it up for your will. Lay your life out like that. And you're going to watch it be filled with what he wants to do in evangelism and in teaching and discipleship. And you're going to watch people grow grow in their maturity and their love 
And it's the greatest thing ever. It's the greatest thing to see Christ formed in someone. Paul was brokenhearted in the Galatians at the end of Galatians. And he says, man, I'm, st- I'm, st- I'm, I'm longing once again for Christ to be formed within you. Basically he's talking about, he was just, was there. Someone was coming in stealing some things or putting legalism in their path. But he just says, I, I long like a father to see Christ formed in you. I think that's the idea of it. And we should have that heart with one another. Do you have that heart? If not, let's go ask the Lord for it. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your sweet son. Thank you for the spirit in which he put in us and did not leave us as orphans. I thank you that you are the one who teaches. You're the one who saves. You're the one who draws. You're the one who evangelizes. I thank you that you use empty vessels like us, that you might be glorified. We pray glorified. I pray that you would fill us as we just declare our emptiness and our inability before you, that you would fill us and that the power of God will work in and through us in our evangelism and in our discipleship. And we pray that the longing of our hearts to see you formed in one another and in this church and in the world would come about by your grace. And so Lord, raise up those in this church who are called to evangelism, raise up those in this church who are called to teach, but Lord, put a fire in every one of us to see your will be done in these areas. In the name of Jesus, we humbly pray and ask. Amen. Love you all. Have a wonderful week in the Lord.